the commission's performing a real uh, vital service by seeking to provide a better understanding of why we face a crisis of U.S. incapacity to produce and procure the goods that we need to combat the coronavirus crisis in the past, and it will be with us going forward. This information is critical to figuring out the proper policy responses. Our testimony provides data and analysis that underscores how decades of hyperglobalization has undermined our reliance against the COVID-19 crisis, and also against whatever is the next crisis, which may not be health related, but for which the lessons of today's mess can provide us ways to be better prepared for the future. The bottom line is that the US is almost entirely dependent on other countries to access some essential goods that we will need for any number of different potential crises, be they the electric grid, communications, or health. It's not just the US. Economies around the world have been organized to basically serve a global production model focused largely on efficiency, with, res with, very very, with companies very reliant on long, brittle supply chains, or production in too many, too few countries of too many goods. So many of the world's wealthiest countries have had the same crises in getting supplies of ventilators, respirators, masks, and other medical equipment. The crisis of COVID-19 made consumers around the world aware of this dial of vulnerability and aware it's not a bug, but a feature of hyperglobalization, underscoring that the answer is not more of the same. We need to recognize in the U.S. that losing 40,000 U.S. manufacturing facilities in the last 25 years has made us unnecessarily vulnerable in the instance of many sorts of crises as COVID-19 has revealed. Factors that have contributed to this hollowing out, trade policies that made it much less risky and cheaper to relocate production, lack of disciplines on currency manipulation that flattened companies domestically trying to compete with imports, waivers to buy American and other domestic procurement preferences that meant that there was not a steady domestic supply for domestic production, including the waivers given to 60 countries. So today, buy American is buy American plus 60 other countries. <laughs> and the merger mania that has been enabled by a lack of competition policy, which meant the elimination of many redundant production facilities as a few dominant firms in key sectors took over. So as the first set of data in this testimony shows, the U.S. trade deficit with China and with the world in pandemic-related PPE, medicines, other products dramatically increased during this period of the COVID-19 crisis. This is already in the context of the U.S. maintaining the world's largest trade deficit year over year and already being extremely reliant on other countries to provide essential goods. February 2020, we had a surplus of 49 million. Now, as our testimony documents, that was in part because the Commerce Department was urging U.S. companies to export COVID-related goods right into March to China. And China, as our data shows, had, regardless of what they said, cut off many of their exports to us of the same goods. By March, the balance was a $31 million deficit. And if you look at the month-over-month month average for the period April, July, gains of a thousand percent deficit plus of over a thousand percent. We have a seven-month deficit of 6.5 billion, five times bigger for this seven-month period than 2019. The rest of the world isn't more comforting. It's almost doubled, and thus our first conclusion: despite efforts to scale up domestic production, the reality is the U.S. became more dependent on imports during the crisis. So that as we think forward, we need to figure out a way to have some domestic supply as clearly we cannot scale up under this paradigm. Number two, there's been a continuous concentration of the supply chain in a handful of countries for critical goods over the, over the past decades. And the lack of diversity in import sources creates vulnerabilities even if there isn't a global disaster which of course is why you need some domestic capacity. But if there is a regional disaster and we are over-reliant on regional suppliers. So we start the data in 89, 
before the NAFTA WTO era. And we look at the top 10 import sources of the key products that the ITC also has identified in its work on the COVID crisis. In 89, Americans had a much more diversified list of countries to import test kits, medicines, ventilators. So they were less affected. We were less affected if something happened in one region or country. Over time, it's gotten extremely concentrated in China and Mexico. So Chinese companies were 13% of the list of COVID-related goods in 89. They're 75% in 2019. This is thus our second conclusion. Over-reliance on imports and increasingly with many critical goods now made only in one or two countries largely poses more fundamental and avoidable risks. And basically, we need both to have some domestic supply and diversify our import supplies. As witnesses on the previous panel made clear, part of the issue with this concentration and with the import reliance is you can't scale up production domestically even if you choose to because the supply chains are so thin that you cannot get particular parts. You cannot get supplies to be able to actually do the manufacturing. And with respect to pandemic related goods, we urge the ITC to also consider the role of monopoly patent protections in many trade agreements, including the WTO, that expose countries to sanctions if they produce without approval and licensing by and payments to pharmaceutical and other firms. Case in point, the sharing of IP and the refusal to do so with the N95 masks and the difference in the supplies worldwide. Our third major finding uh, is our overdependence in imports in general and from in general, but specifically from China and India, is um, acute in pharmaceuticals. And that creates significant public health vulnerabilities before, during, and after any kind of pandemic crisis. The trade deficit in pharmaceuticals is more than tripled from 32 billion in 2006 to 93 billion in March of this year. That's before COVID. The map graphic. And our testimony shows by some specific medicines, the concentration of import sources. And here I wanted to stop and point out two very important data problems, <laughs> some of which you've heard. One is the inavailability of the needed data in some instances. For instance, and this we urge the ITC to recommend improvements in the data keeping. Drugs and APIs, active pharmaceutical ingredients, which are chemicals, are sprinkled all over the HS codes. And often, as you get down into the higher levels, the non-pharmaceutical uses and pharmaceutical grade uses of certain chemicals are in the same eight or 10 digit HS code, meaning you can't differentiate, you don't know where the stuff is coming from. The, the improvement that was made, for instance, in the context of masks, so that we now know the N95s broken out is the kind of improvement that'd be very helpful there. As well, there's a lot of information that's trade secret, as we're hearing. So we don't know the total U.S. supply of something. We know where the imports are coming from. The closest approximation for medicines is basically where FDA inspects plants. That is no approximation because it doesn't say anything about volume or even what's made there. It's all trade secret. We heard from the guys from the medical device uh, um, trade association that two thirds of the stuff is made in the U.S., but we don't know that because we have no data. And then the second point, as the ITC is looking at the stuff we do have data for, it's really critical to look at the volume data, not the value data. Our testimony has both the volume and the value data over time. The table showing, for instance, the concentration of supply and imports, which basically are showing that what we actually are importing, the goods, the volume, is totally disparate from what the value shows. The value shows transfer pricing, it shows tax strategies relating to where you're pricing IP. And so the Canadian Embassy witness talked about things that Canada was a top provider of. <laughs> In disinfectants, volume and value, Canada's number one. But looking at antibiotics, actually, if you look at the volume, Canada's number six. By value only, do they look like they're on the top? Same thing about the, the notion of only 3.5% of medical devices coming from China, we heard in the previous panel. That's actually if you only look at value, not if you look at volume. China is the top producer of, say, test kits by volume. They're not even in the top 10 by value. 
getting that data right is incredibly important. Finally, before concluding with our views on the remedies, I want to just flag three other data findings that our testimony included that are aimed at debunking claims that were not supported by the data. Number one, we provide the data showing that the U.S. exports to China of COVID critical goods jumping in January and continue to spike through July 2020. We referenced the letter from the Commerce Department to companies urging them to export while we were not coordinating across the government and undermining our own supplies, but our exports have continued to spike, which gets to number two, which that the U.S. starting to do an export review policy in April did not cause other countries to cut us off, and that was not the cause of our short supplies in these goods. Rather, as you can see at tradewatch.org in the live video map, we were one of the last countries in the world to implement any kind of review. The EU implemented a review like ours a month earlier. China and India implemented bans of exports. Clearly, being two months after does not have a retaliation against the US for starting to do what everyone else had done for months or weeks. And then finally, contrary to the Chinese government claims, the data shows that in fact they did, starting in December and January, cut off exports to the US of the category of COVID response goods. Hmm. The imports plummeted and our data controls for seasonality, which is major in those months and for the section 301 tariffs. Conclusion, which is, the people, people in the U.S. have realized we have a problem. The answer is both having domestic supply and diversifying our import supplies. And our testimony lays out some of the policy tools that are available to do that. Thank you very much.